The Triassic is my personal favourite geological time period. The main reason for this is that a lot of the animals that lived during this time were so weird. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at some of the extraordinary animals that lived during this bizarre period in Earth's history. So first things first, why were there so many strange animals in the Triassic? Researchers believe that the main reason is the mass extinction event at the end of the previous period, the Permian, 252 million years ago, colloquially known as the Great Dying, with estimates ranging around 80 to 90 percent of all species becoming extinct from this event. It's no surprise that with this clean slate, the few survivors had next to no competition. Among the survivors were the reptiles. Over time, these lucky few would evolve and adapt to fill the niches left vacant from the extinction in a phenomenon known as an adaptive radiation. Evolution does not have goals. Organisms simply evolve traits at random, and those that just happen to be favourable are passed on to the next generation. The more successful species outcompete the less successful ones. But when competition is minimal, there is room to experiment more. This is how we get stuff like this, and this, or even this. In this video, I'm going to be focusing on non-dinosaur and non-pterosaur reptiles. With that in mind, I would like to start with a group thought to be very close to the dinosaurs, to a point where some researchers have even found them to be dinosaurs, the Silesaurids. They are confidently assigned to the more inclusive group, Dinosauromorpha, a group including dinosaurs and all animals more closely related to them than to pterosaurs. They seem to have occupied quite a few ecological niches, with basal member Louisuchus being a carnivore, transitional forms Silesaurus and Acilisaurus thought to have been omnivorous, culminating with the most derived members like Quanosaurus being herbivores. This shift in diet mirrors that seen in the sauropodomorph dinosaurs, suggesting that the Silesaurids were also being competitively excluded from the small carnival guild, perhaps also by theropod dinosaurs. The later herbivorous members bear a striking resemblance to the third major group of dinosaurs, the Ornithischians. So much so, some researchers have found the Silesaurids to be basal Ornithischians, meaning they would be true dinosaurs, but this is still highly debated. Up next are the Lagerpetids, a group of small archosaurs that researchers are unsure whether they were quadrupedal or bipedal hoppers. Researchers have long placed them as close relatives of dinosaurs, but more recently have been suggested to be close to the ancestry of pterosaurs within the more inclusive group Pterosauromorpha, all animals more closely related to pterosaurs than to dinosaurs. Two other animals, Scleromoclus and the recently named and described Mehari, are also thought to be close relatives of pterosaurs, the former showing adaptations to leaping, suggesting a model of evolution that pterosaurs evolved from animals good at leaping, and their forelimbs eventually evolved into wings, with their hind limbs perhaps aiding in takeoff for flight. We've started pretty tame in terms of weirdness, as both Silesaurids and Basal Pterosauromorphs are members of Ava Metatarsalia, one of the two major groups of archosaurs that includes all taxa more closely related to dinosaurs than to crocodilians. Now we shall delve into the other major group of archosaurs, the Pseudosuchians, the group that contains crocodilians and all taxa more closely related to them than dinosaurs. First up are the Erythrosuchids, a family of quadrupedal carnivores who, when you look at just their bodies, they look very conservative and tame. But then you get to the head and they are absurdly large. They were the top predators of the early and middle Triassic before being displaced by members of the somewhat problematic group, 
the Rawisukians. This group's validity is a bit all over the place. Some studies have found that it consists of only distantly related taxa and is sometimes referred to as a wastebasket taxon, where specimens are referred to a taxon simply because they don't seem to fit anywhere else. These animals do all have a distinct trait in common, however. They convergently evolved erect limbs independently from dinosaurs. Among the taxa often included in Rawisukia is the genus Saurosuchus, a large quadrupedal carnivore from the Ischigualasto formation in Argentina. Another genus is Postosuchus of walking with dinosaurs fame. Whilst originally interpreted as a quadruped, more recent studies have concluded that because its forelimbs were so much smaller than its hind limbs, they were more likely to have been bipeds, yet another case of convergence with dinosaurs. The Tenosauriscids are a family also included in Rawisukia. These carnivores' most striking feature are their sails, made from their elongated neural spines, similar to those of Dimetrodon and Spinosaurus. It is unknown what purpose these sails served. They may have been for thermoregulation or sexual selection. Close relatives of the Tenosauriscids were the Shuvosaurids, a group of bipedal, toothless herbivores thought to have had beaks for cropping plants. Most of them were of modest size, rarely exceeding two meters in length. But isolated remains that may belong to the genus Psilosuchus may represent an animal 10 meters long, but their assignment to this genus remains uncertain. Sticking with the herbivore theme, next up we have Aetosaurs, armored quadrupedal herbivores that bear a striking resemblance to nodosaurid dinosaurs. The genus Desmatosuchus in particular had large shoulder spikes, very reminiscent of those of Sauropelta. This armor was presumably for defense against predators such as the previously mentioned Rawisukians, such as Postosuchus. Another group of quadrupedal herbivores were the Rhynchosaurs. They had small, stocky, lizard-like bodies and distinct heads. They had incredibly broad cheekbones, and the tips of their jaws formed long, sharp beaks, presumably giving them a powerful bite for feeding on tough plant matter. A new member of this group was described whilst I was writing the script for this video, in fact. The incredibly fun to say, B.C.W.O. Kuwuse. And no, that is not a typo. It was found in the Popo Aggie Formation in Wyoming, dated to the late Triassic. For our next batch of weirdos, we go to the Madigen Formation in Kyrgyzstan, dated to the late Triassic. First up, we have Sharovipteryx, a lizard-like reptile with a membrane stretching from its pelvis to its hind limbs and tail. It is thought to be an insectivorous glider, similar to how modern Draco lizards glide between trees. But it is the only known gliding animal whose wings connect to its pelvis rather than the pectoral girdle. Next, we have the poster child of Triassic weirdos, Longisquama. This reptile is famous for its tall, hockey stick-shaped appendages protruding from its back. Their function has puzzled scientists since its discovery. Some hypothesized they were wings similar to modern Draco lizards, but this theory isn't as well supported. They may have been for species recognition and or sexual display. It was once hypothesized to be close to the ancestry of birds, but this theory has since been heavily refuted since the discovery of bird-like theropod dinosaurs. Its classification is also a mystery, as its fossils do not preserve many diagnostic traits to assign the genus to specific groups on the reptile family tree. Oh yeah, I almost forgot to mention the giant killer grasshoppers. So, Giga Titan was also discovered here, a member of Titanoptera, an extinct group of insects thought to be related to grasshoppers, but had convergently evolved raptorial front limbs similar to mantises. They had been around since the Carboniferous period, and they certainly look like a holdover from the age of giant arthropods. Going back to reptiles, next we have Kyrgyzsaurus, 
it is a member of my personal favourite group of Triassic animals, aside from dinosaurs and ichthyosaurs of course, the Drapanosaurs. Kyrgyzsaurus looks almost indistinguishable from a lizard, but it is an extremely conservative member of its family. Drapanosaurus itself was essentially a chameleon mixed with a silky anteater. They were thought to be arboreal insectivores, with large claws on their forelimbs for breaking into tree branches and trunks to extract insects from within. They also had prehensile tails tipped with a claw, something unique in vertebrates as far as I know. Their skulls were also very bird-like, so much so that the genus Avicranium literally means bird cranium. Arguably the weirdest in a family of weirdos was Hyperonectar from the late Triassic Lakatong formation in New Jersey. Its name means deep-tailed swimmer from the lake, as its discoverers hypothesized that it would have used its deep, paddle-like tail for swimming. Fitting considering it was discovered in lake deposits in the Newark Supergroup, an ancient group of great lakes in eastern North America during the Triassic. I talked about this in my review of When Dinosaurs Roamed America, which you should watch, hint hint shameless self-promotion. Other researchers, however, believe that its tail would have been too delicate to be an efficient paddle, and instead interpret it as arboreal like other drapanosaurs. A popular restoration is of its tail being a leaf mimic as a form of camouflage. More extreme restorations are of it as a glider. I don't know how well supported that is, but honestly, anything is possible with Triassic animals. Up until now, we've been talking exclusively about terrestrial animals, but there was also a whole host of weirdos living in the aquatic ecosystems of the Triassic. Starting off tame, we have the Phytosaurs, a group of either archosaurs or very close relatives of archosaurs that convergently evolved strongly with crocodilians. They are thought to have occupied identical niches to them. A major way they differ from crocodilians are that their nostrils are located much further up the snout and sometimes are higher on the skull than the eyes, most likely an adaptation to be able to breathe whilst the rest of the body was submerged in water. They were a successful and diverse group with three different recognized skull morphotypes thought to have been catered to their lifestyle and ecology. Redondosaurus is an example of the first morph, brachyrostral, or short-snouted, thought to have been adapted to macropredation, taking on large prey with a high bite force. Mystriosuchus is an example of the second morph, dolichorostral, long-snouted, thought to have been piscivorous with a much lower bite force, similar to modern gharials. Machaeroprosopus validus, formerly identified as the genus Rutiodon, is an example of the third morph, Altirostral, high snouted, an intermediate state between the other two, suggestive of a more generalist lifestyle. Confusingly, despite all known members being carnivorous, the name Phytosaur means plant lizard, as the first Phytosaur skull discovered in 1828 was surrounded by fossilized, petrified mud that its discoverers misidentified as herbivore teeth. Up next we have Van Clevia, thought to be a relative of the archosaurs, but its placement is hard to define. It has some very strange features indeed. Its dentition especially is very striking, as it bears huge fangs on both the upper and lower tooth row. It was thought to be a semi-aquatic freshwater carnivore, but its anatomy for said ecology is quite novel. Practically all swimming tetrapods with fin-like tails are formed by their tall tail vertebrae. But Van Clevia's is formed by osteoderms, bony scutes formed in the skin. Now we shall delve into the Sauroterygians, a group that fully specialised into aquatic habitats and were incredibly successful. Included in this group are the long-necked, four-flippered pistosaurs, which in turn includes their presumed descendants, the plesiosaurs, by far the most famous members of the group, and the only ones that survived the extinction at the end of the Triassic. 
They went on to flourish and diversify all through the following Jurassic period and lasted until the mass extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, standing or swimming as one of the greatest success stories of the Mesozoic era. However, let's take a look at some of their lesser known cousins. First up are the Nothosaurs. These animals can be succinctly described as amphibious plesiosaurs. They have long necks with conical interlocking teeth for hunting fish and squid. Unlike them, however, Nothosaurs had webbed fingers and toes and were thought to have been capable of movement on land, living similarly to modern seals and sea lions. I'm especially fond of this reconstruction by Anthony Hutchings of a Nothosaurus blowing salt water out of its nose like modern marine iguanas. It is unknown whether they nested and laid their eggs on land like modern sea turtles, or gave live birth in water like other marine reptiles. Another branch on the Sauroterygian family tree are the Placodons. Their teeth were adapted to durophagy, eating animals with shells. The earliest members of the group, such as Placodus, had a longer, streamlined, lizard-like body plan, whereas later members had complex shells, superficially resembling turtles, to which they were only distantly related. It has been speculated that later members, such as Cephoderma, evolved their armoured carapaces due to the threat of predation from sharks and other marine reptiles. In every family, there is the weird uncle. For Sauroterygia, that title definitely goes to Atopodentatus. Whilst its body is very similar to that of a Nothosaur, the skull is where things get freaky. When it was first discovered, the jaws appeared to have a bizarre vertical zipper-like form, unlike anything else in the animal kingdom. The name Atopodentatus means unusual teeth, and I can understand why. It was hypothesized as being a filter feeder of small invertebrates being uncovered from the sea floor. In 2016, however, another specimen was described and showed that the original specimen's skull had been heavily disfigured, warping the jawline into the strange vertical zipper shape seen in the fossils. In life, its jaws formed a flattened hammer shape and it was thought to have fed on algae on the sea floor, similar to modern marine iguanas, making it the oldest known herbivorous marine reptile. From zipper to nightmare to derpy hammerhead herbivore. What a glow up. Next we have another of my personal favourites, Tanny Strophius. Known most famously for its appearance in Chased by Sea Monsters, which I plan on reviewing later this year, where it was depicted as an aquatic ambush predator. Our views on this reptile's life habits have changed drastically since its discovery. The very first reconstruction was that of a long-tailed pterosaur of all things, under the name Tribalesodon, as its characteristic long neck vertebrae were misinterpreted as the wing fingers seen in pterosaurs. The original specimen was destroyed by Allied bombing in Milan during World War II. Future finds of more complete skeletons help to show the true nature of the animal as a non-pterosaur, non-flying, long-necked reptile, and renamed the taxon to Tanistrophius. A common depiction of this reptile is that of the aforementioned aquatic ambush predator, stealthily approaching a shoal of fish or squid with its long neck before striking, using its conical interlocking teeth to trap the prey in the mouth. Another interpretation by Dr. Mark Witten in 2015 is that of a terrestrial animal that hunted aquatic prey from the shore, akin to a heron. The most recent studies have found support for the aquatic hypothesis, with support from trackways attributed to tanistrophiids, interpreted as only the feet touching the substrate in these supposedly quadrupedal animals caused by hind limb propelled swimming, similar to that of frogs. Now, as for these supposed tail dropping, well, I'll talk more about that when I get to my sea monsters review. Last 
but certainly not least, we have what is arguably the strangest Triassic animal of them all. An animal whose name, I swear, sounds like a DJ scratching on the turntables. Arachnoripus. Is that just me? It had a long, toothless snout, thought to have flattened out into a bill shape. It may have even had a type of baleen, like some whales for filter feeding on small invertebrates. Its limbs were flattened into flippers and may have been used to crawl and disturb animals in the substrate to feed on them. This animal was essentially a weird reptilian version of the platypus, because the platypus wasn't weird enough already, apparently. Speaking of the platypus, we don't know whether Arepmoripus laid eggs on land like them, or whether it gave live birth at sea. Whatever the case, Arepmoripus gets my personal vote for weirdest Triassic animal of the bunch, and that is saying a lot. Wow, I was not expecting this video to end up being this long. There was just so much I wanted to cover, and I have had a wonderful time researching for this video. As I said at the beginning, the Triassic is my favourite geological time period, as it is perhaps the greatest example of evolutionary crossroads in natural history. It is the perfect mix of what had come before and what was to come after, and jumbled amongst them were some of the strangest and most extraordinary animals that had ever lived, never to be seen again. Thank you so much for watching, and let me know what your favourite Triassic animal is in the comments below. Please do like the video and subscribe for more content in the future. Bye bye now.